I am your soldier, I mean servant, and this is Power of the Daleks, written by David Whittaker. Welcome, everyone, and thank you for joining the 49th production of an unearthly podcast featuring Power of the Dollars, written by David Whitaker and starring Patrick Troughton, recording live on March 14, 2014. Yeah, so uh, happy Pi Day to all of us here on uh, Western Society. Hope you had some today. And for those of us, uh, or for those of you listening to us in Japan, uh, happy White Day. I hope you My got pie that. My uh, pepperoni. Pie Bill. Pepperoni. <laughs> And I hope you got that, uh, those of you in Japan, I hope you got that special girl something special. Yeah. Okay. You and your pie. I am the man in black, and with me are Mad Matt. Hello. And ron Sun. Always a pleasure. As always, you can find us on Twitch slash MadMatt2185, YouTube slash Man in Black Reviews, Facebook slash Unearthly Podcast, and Twitter slash Unearthly Pod. And of course, the various dot coms and all of those. Before and for those of you that were listening last week and found out we weren't here, I would like to apologize. I had something rather big jumped on, uh, dumped in my lap on Friday, and it wound up taking me all day to take care of. By the time I got around to being able to talk to these guys, it was near the end of our normal podcast time. So I apologize for that. Mm-hmm. Before we get to the real Doctor Who news, we have some semi-podcast-related news. Author Philip Sandifer of Tardis Eruditorium has published, or at least sent out to his Kickstarter backers, the revised version of his book on the First Doctor. And my name is in the acknowledgments, so I am now a part of a published Doctor Who work. Hmm. Yay. A Kickstarted, yeah. Yeah. I mean, really, really, that's just like the special thanks at the end of the Lord of the Rings stuff, isn't it? <laughs> When uh, Peter Jackson's thanked everybody that was in the uh, the fan club, essentially. Pretty much. Kind of, I guess. Although I'm sure the, that he asked for help with anything that went that he needed aid with, though, too. Go on to oh, I'm our talking rock. about that huge, like, ten-minute wall of names at the end of the special edition. Oh, okay. <laughs> Mm, mm. I, I I didn't I, I didn't look at the credits back in those days, but I remember something similar when I was watching Iron Man three and I saw the special effects credits. Oh, these aren't special and, effects credits. These were just no. thanks special thanks I to. Uh, yeah, but I just mean the, the special effects credits were pretty much three solid screens of names in the smallest font they could put on the credits. They kind of have to these days. There were yeah. hundreds of people doing the special effects for that movie. Yeah. <laughs> they probably need thousands of computers just to do it, too. <laughs> yeah. So, we do have a bit of news, because even though last episode was a very news-light episode... Uh, we, it has been two weeks. two weeks. Yeah, it's been two weeks, and each of them had their own news, because apparently BBC decided to say, fuck you for taking a week off. Mm -hmm. <laughs> of course. So uh, our first bit here is uh, of our Titan Comics, uh, who has taken over Doctor Who from IDW, has uh, revealed the covers of their 10th Doctor and 11th Doctor lines. Sweet. Oh yeah, I was looking at these earlier today. Uh, nothing really you know, spectacular. Nothing normally yeah, spectacular, but at least they're not horrible. No, they're um, not horrible. They, I'd, I'd, have, one, I'd one, have to see how the inner art is, to mm -hmm. be honest. One, one comment I'd like to make about them is that the uh, the backgrounds and the art style kind of remind me of the 60s Doctor Who openings, except in full 
1960s psychedelic color. Hmm. To a minor possible they didn't degree. They not bother yeah. me that much. For me, it's the no, comical. I'm not, I'm not saying... He's not saying it's bad. It's just that it's actually oh, got yeah, color. I'm, not... I'm, 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 I'm basically saying if, if it, it's, it seems to me like an homage to, say, the Patrick Troutman opening. I don't know. I couldn't tell all you for sure. I wouldn't say the Troughton opening. The Troughton opening was all black and white. Again, um, he said colorized. And really and really wasn't that overly psychedelic like, like compared to the first one. But like, it, like specifically looking at the uh, the Tenant one, the background reminds me a lot of the waving lines they had in those two openings, except mm -hmm. if you added to them. That's, uh, it's, that's why it's I kind possible of feel that's where they got some of their motif. Right. It looks more like an Aurora Borealis to me, but that's me. Hmm. Aurora Borealis doesn't quite move like that, though. No, but that's artist renditioning thereof. Right. Mm. Um, but yeah, so it's the 10th and 11th Doctor in new series. Apparently they're giving 10 a new companion. Head tilt. Yeah, I'm kind of and... wondering about that myself. He, he does have enough gaps. I mean, if this is... Technically, um, he does is, have a lot of gaps, yes. Yeah, if this is either between season, between series 2 and 3, between 3 and 4, or between 4 um, and four, 5... It, you can the fit, only you can real fit. gap Tenet has is between... Well, okay, between the Christmas specials and the episodes, you can, yeah. Yeah, yeah okay. Yeah, because there's, there's a chunk between um, Runaway Bride and um, Smith and & Jones... Yeah. Right. And there's another chunk between um, Voyage, Voyage of the, the Dam, Dam and, uh, and Partners in Crime. Yeah. And then, of course, there's between, the... each, between each special, you could fit anything a lot of you really stuff. Yeah. Yes. And then, oh, of you course, could, there's the Doctor's enough, Big. You could fit another special in between the specials, as uh, Stephen Moffat has kindly done. Mm hmm. Yeah, there's a lot of space there because anytime the doctor's on his own, you can pretty much specify any length of time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we already know he's pretty much lying out out his ass about his age. So yeah, yeah, I'm kind of estimating that he's like fifteen to seventeen hundred now, um, based on uh, time of the doctor. He might he might be pushing two K. Maybe. I, mm -hmm. He seems to lie about more and more. I still think more than that just because, I mean, he was a thousand-ish when he regenerated to the eighth. And he was. Even though, even though the idea of him restarting the numbering was something that is not in the show, it's kind of supported by the way the doctors discuss amongst themselves afterward. For example, we can tell the war doctor clearly lived for hundreds and hundreds of years. Yeah, he mm -hmm. claims to be younger in, uh, what's the next time he mentions his age? That would be Aliens in London. He's younger than he was in Time in the Ronnie, according to him. Yes. So, I like to like get younger. started counting again. Yeah. Or 43, yeah. Lost continent is starting to back up again. <laughs> right. And if you go by that, then that would mean that he's somewhere around 23, 2400 in time of the doctor. Old, I, even I more feel older by the end of it. Yeah. True. Next article then? Yep. Yeah. Our got a lot to go is, through. Uh, this oh. this is interesting and occur um if anyone has seen a, an update of this correct me but they've announced a region 1 of a BBC special before the region 2 has been announced. And I feel like that's a strange thing to happen. Actually, um, I'm not getting this link. Yeah, I, I, I thought the next piece of news was the BBC 3 to cease broadcasting. Did I skip a link? Um, I think you did. Oh, oh, oh actually, I, okay, yeah. I did, there I, did, is. I did skip a link. I always skip a link. I, yeah, the link you skipped is actually is not working. Oh, yeah. um, that's kind of weird. Um, if you click latest um, news, you should be able to scroll down and find it, though. I think you might have added a minus or something to the link, so therefore. Oh. Um, uh, so what would uh, it be then? Oh yeah, I see the two dashes at the end. I don't know where they came from, but. Uh, that's is it what... uh, the Kelly one, or? 
What here? Uh, it's here. Hang on, I'll have it for you in a second. Yeah, for sure. Oh, Plan 55? No, it's BBC3 to stop transmission. Try this one, Matt. There Something we go. that happened with copying and pasting process killed it. Yep. Oh, and you know what happened? It was because it was a a Skype had was treating it as a quote, so it might have added something to it when it was copied and okay. pasted that way. Yep. Because we discussed it a week ago and then copied and pasted it. Uh-huh. Everyone's got so, it now though. Yep. Yeah. Actually, yeah. No, we we talked about this amongst ourselves during the, the yeah. half hour at the end there. But yeah, um, BBC Three has confirmed that it is no longer going to uh, have any broadcast um, after the autumn of 2015. Uh, it is going entirely to a web-based channel, hmm. meaning it'll still exist. It'll be on the internet, and um, but it won't need to use any form of transmission towers or anything like that. Um, this is particularly interesting because the uh, they estimate that will save them more than 50 million pounds annually hmm. and allow them to put 30 of that back into BBC One drama, which means some of that will trickle back into the Doctor Who budget. Yes, and I would love for them to get some more budget back into that thing. Pretty pleased with it Sugar needs... on Top. Um, it, it really however, need... that is still a drop in the bucket um, because the BBC needs to save around a hundred million pounds after their license fee was frozen in 2010, which was in a 15% of their total budget. Now we've talked about this on the podcast a little bit. Yes. How we've, how we noticed the graphics, uh, like, um, BBC is no longer using the mill for their special effects. Um, they're going with cheaper alternatives mm -hmm. and it shows and they kind of have to because of this. Because of this um, this budget freeze. Now, Doctor Who isn't hit as badly as other BBC shows because Doctor Who is a co-production. So it's also getting money from BBC America. Which is helping but, it a little bit. Yeah, but BBC America is also a U.S. cable channel, and cable channels don't have the biggest of budget either. Unless they're HBO, I think. That's a premium channel, and that's, that's a, different. Yeah. Same so with Showtime and stuff like that. <clears throat> yeah. I know absolutely nothing about HBO, television. Cinemax, Showtime, the movie channel, Encore, Stars, are all premium channels, meaning you have that you have to pay extra on your cable to get them. Right. And technically, you do have to pay so extra to get BBC America, so, so but BBC it's usually America. part of package yeah. deal. Uh, BBC America is a second tier which means you're paying um, additional for a block of channels. Yes. But it's not considered a premium channel where you're basically paying through the nose for one channel. Okay. See, as, as someone who doesn't get involved in paying for cable and probably never will because of things like Hulu and Netflix, I... And... No, no, no. Oh, I should also say that some <laughs> cable networks actually include BBC in their regular package. Depends upon um, your cable network, yes. Yes. Not to mention it's it, actually a good idea to get cable because their internet provider is also pretty fast. And since since we're talking about channels, I think I'm going to skip uh, a few links ahead. Uh, if you guys see the link that's from uh, horrorchannel.co.uk, which actually answers a question I had about this article. Um, but uh, Classic Doctor Who is going to start airing on, I guess it's a UK channel, uh, Horror Channel. Hmm. Um, I could see that. I can see that um, with a lot of their episodes, yeah. Yeah, a lot of like the third, uh, late third and early fourth Doctor episodes. Oh yeah, such could the be early classified fourth. more as horror than right. sci-fi. I mean, the the second Doctor era is essentially monster invasions, which is a subgenre of horror. Yes, that too. Mm -hmm. But I mean, the the really the behind the sofa starts about with terror of the autons. Right. And goes through, I would say, somewhere mid Leela. 
<laughs> Probably Horror of Fang Rock is the last breath of that. Kind of, sort of. Oh, I'm, I must have misread this the first time because I thought they were airing the entire series, but it looks like there's 30 specific adventures from Classic Who that they're going to be airing. Yeah, if they're, especially if they're handpicking certain ones, then yeah, I can definitely yeah, see then it. Yeah, then it'll definitely, definitely be the specific Including the Mind Robber, the Daemons, Genesis of mm -hmm. the Daleks, Talons of Wang Chiang, what do, the what do you, what of you think? What do you think they're going to huh. pick for... Oh, there's a, there's a list? There's oh, like I a li There's I, a I, partial I list. Yeah, um, no, the Caves of Handazani. They, they said the first seven Doctors, so I'm kind of wondering what they're going to pick for uh, the first Doctor. The yeah, Cyberman. I don't see one in there. I see the Mind Robber, yeah, they don't, they don't which is second. One, yeah. The Daemons is third. Genesis is fourth. Talons is also fourth. The Caves of Andrazani is fifth. Attack of the Cybermen is sixth. And Curse of Fendrith is seventh. So Wait. they got two fourths, but they don't have a first. The Daleks and the Tenth Planet are. Oh, both, they're going to uh, start with an unearthly yeah. child. Ah. Oh, okay. Gonna... Okay. Uh, here's a question: Are they going to? Are they including uh, ten thousand or a hundred thousand BC in that? That's usually listed with an unearthly child. Yeah. That usually you don't, is. They, yes. They're not listed separately when you Un when you purchase right. the DVD. It's called an unearthly child, and it has yeah. both of those in there. I mean, so, folks, if like, you really want a really good first episode and a boring couple of episodes afterwards, yeah, here you go. Yeah, the, the, <laughs> so the they're, tribe they're of They're not Dom necessarily is obliged to play them together. They might. I could see them doing a television version of, say, the first Doctor Who movie, where they start <sighs> with unearthly child and roll straight into the Daleks. Yeah, but there's it's actually um those days the stories were fairly linear and continuous. Um the episode would end mm. with the pre bump to the next it's, one. Oh yeah, so but you could still end that just and, right and just yeah, go right into Dalek. That's, that's true, but people still marathon it skipping out hundred thousand B C sometimes without really I mean, you do I, I, lose I, you do lose a bit of character development and I personally would not do that. But I would not be shocked by anyone who, by any network or person that did that. I can't machete order it. I'm sorry. I, I, we'll sit you through Tribe of Gum again, Randy, and then we'll see what you think about it. I've watched that one 15 times, Matt. Another <sighs> watch is not going to stop me. The, that's that that story is blander than freaking crackers on white freaking rice. Oh. Hey. Remember, yeah. we decided we decided that there were other first Doctor stories that were more boring than Tribe of Gum. Gunfighters, so. gunfighters, gunfighters. <laughs> well, there are other stories that were dumber. Yes. Zarbi, Zarbi, Zarbi. Yeah. <laughs> Do I need to <laughs> go on? <laughs> okay, so since we're kind of machete um, ordering the news. Um, the concept that we mentioned of bandwidth um, brought up a, something that I wanted to bring up, and that is the we fact mentioned that bandwidth? we mentioned bandwidth right before you jumped to Horror Channel, yes. You did? Yes. I'll take your word for it. Apparently anyway, I was nothing. Apparently you weren't. And the news there is actually I don't even see this on your list. Yeah. Um, I don't see it on the list. I don't know how. Um, it's, a, it's a it's a it's a little above. Uh, Planet Fifty Five may leave Australia, and that is um, Planet Fifty Five is the people that have been doing the more recent animations, including Reign of Terror and Tenth Planet. And um, they told the Senate Select Subcommittee uh, for the National Broadband Network that the lack of bandwidth is going to cause them to move from New South Wales to the UK. Now, and does that I mean understand... That, does that mean that internet in Australia is government-run? Yeah, essentially. Yes. I have actually talked to my friend in Australia on this, and the um, bandwidth in Australia is horrible. And the bandwidth restrictions are horrible. Um... My friend could literally, uh, you basically, when you pay for a service provider, you get a monthly allotment of bandwidth, and then they throttle you down. Um, 
and it's like something like 30 uh, gigabits per set or 30 gigabit total per month. Now, for, and pro from what I understand properly, because of like uh, contracts of what of uh, who can you know who can release what in Australia, they also like extra police various uh, file sharing sites to make sure that things that aren't released in Australia don't end up being downloaded by Australians. Is that right? I'm I, not even going into the, the concept about that. No, no, we don't know, to be honest. This, is, this isn't anything regarding this. This is just max bandwidth usage per household. Right. And um, that's private. I'm pretty sure business gets a higher rate. But still, you've got to figure that these guys are moving uncompressed video of half hour in length up and down from there to the United Kingdom, which is the complete other side of the planet. So basically, they have to route pipe from Australia through the United States and from the United States to England. Or they have to do it by satellite transfer either way, which, by the way, that's going to be slower than hell. Um, mm -hmm. Either way, it's either very expensive or very slow. Um, and if there is a maximum data cap for businesses, they're hitting that and getting throttled. Um, On a weekly basis, I would assume, almost. Yeah, I would assume. And that's not working well. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, you can't be having that. And, yeah, they're... they're um, um, at the moment... There, it's going to cost them about a million dollars Australian to transfer, which they would rather not because they would uh, um, be able to train more talent and spend it on animators, but they're thinking of relocating to Cardiff. If things don't get fixed. Yeah. So officially, big business for you, Australia, is telling you you need to lighten it up. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I can see part of it. I mean, oh, Australia they're getting out of there, a, and there's less of their own talent there. Well, Australia as a country is pretty isolated. Um, the United States technically is, too, if you consider the United States to essentially be North America. Um, in the aspect of connection speed, I mean, we can connect to Canada relatively easy. We can connect to Mexico relatively easy. We connect anywhere beyond Mexico and Canada. We're isolated. Um, but the United States has put down enough fiber optic cable in the ocean that that's not an issue. Australia hasn't yet. They've got some links down there, but they don't have as many as North America. Not by a long shot. So they're literally limited by the max amount, maximum amount of upload-download that is going in and out of the country. So I think that might be part of the issue. I don't know um, if that's the entire issue, but that's probably a good chunk of it. Okay, so we've covered a couple of things. Let's see. Um, What, we, what else we got? Um, I, had were... I, had, I, had, I had mentioned, but we had stopped because I was accidentally skipping ahead about the uh, Blu-ray release of An Adventure in Time and Space. Mm -hmm. Except Adventure I think I referred space to it as a DVD. Time, yeah. Sorry, yeah. Space it's Region 1 Blu-ray, so... And I'm... Yeah, that's, I mean, that's I'm, actually... Cool no, no, me, I'm harping on that, but the fact that it's a Region 1 without the Region 2 having been announced kind of shocking considering it's something created by the BBC. Yeah, I'm wondering if it's also... Is there a also... that? Um, not that I've seen. Um, it depends on who's actually doing it. Um, generally Doctor Who releases are done by To Entertain, which is a London company. And they'll of course release Region 2 UK first before releasing the... Re, re, before doing the re-encode for Region 1. Mm-hmm. Um, back before To Entertain, uh, Doctor Who was released, I think, through Warner Brothers DVD. That sounds right to me. 
But once the new series came out and was ex- was successful, Two Entertain took over everything, and I think Two Entertain is basically uh, the BBC's output go-to people for DVDs. Yeah, like exclusive license kind of thing. Usually is at least. Um. So it might be that this one's released independently because I do not see a Two Entertain logo on the uh, the prototype box. Yep, it just says I'm BB- wondering... BBC. So BBC if... might have thrown the money into it to try and make it their own this time. Oh, I'm looking. Uh, apparently, the, on uh, disc two is the pilot as well as uh, the first serial. So as we were discussing, an unearthly child along with hundred thousand uh, BC. Uh, oh, and it looks like there's both a Blu-ray and DVD included in the package okay yeah it might be the difference that uh they just wanted to get the blu-ray out there um blu-ray is kind of the way things are going um kind of the revolution has finally hit so we're going to be seeing more and more blu-ray only releases and right. slowly well, I think that is kind DVDs. of interesting uh having the blue the blu-ray and dvd together so that way if if you only have a dvd player now you can buy it and you'll still have that Blu-ray for when you go ahead and finally catch yeah, up with Blu-ray Yeah, that's players. referred to as a hybrid release, um, is what they call them in the business, is hybrid. And I've been getting a lot of those um, for the convention, but I'm seeing some stuff now that's coming out Blu-ray only. Um, one of my favorite anime series, actually my favorite anime series, is being remastered and re-released on Blu-ray starting this month. You hear that, PlayStation 3? You're going to have a use again. Well, if you look at the price of Blu-ray players, they're down to affordable now. <laughs> that's that's the like, same thing that happened with D- that's the same thing that happened with DVD cuz I remember when the PS2 came out, a DVD player was going like $4 and the cheapest way to watch them was to buy a PS2. Within a couple of years of the PS2 becoming popular, DVD players plummeted in price. Yeah, and it's happening with Blu-ray now as they're no longer on the techno edge, so they've uh, they're down to about fifty bucks now. Uh, and it's still about a hundred bucks for the 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 you know the the like um the what are the smart players that you can also connect to like Netflix and stuff on. I still have to look up at my VHS tapes of the Record of Lowest War that I never finished watching and sigh. Right. Yeah. My, well. my VCR literally died just before I could even get onto tape two. <laughs> you realize, Matt, that I converted entirely over to DVD um, almost ten years ago now. Screw you, dude. I still have like three I... movies of Godzilla on VHS right now. See, Actually, no, I four. Have, four I have, I have a have very VHS. small... VHS collection of stuff I could no longer afford to repurchase on DVD. I'm, I'm at the point right now where I have equal amounts of VHS and DVD, and since my VCR just died, I'm contemplating either buying a new VCR at the thrift store, or saying fuck it and starting with uh, more DVDs. I would go the latter, although at this point you're going yeah. to be behind the, behind the curve anyway because this is the point people are going to Blu-rays. But it's also the point that my collection of DVDs will zoom through the roof. (laughs) And really the concept of owning um, media is becoming smaller and smaller all the time with services like Netflix and digital download companies. It's really... I'm sorry, no, I still want to watch stuff when I want to about commercials, and I'm not paying uh, extra money for it. my My DVD collection is so small at this point. Uh, Matt, you didn't hear the concept digital downloads. And I'm not talking illegal downloads. I'm talking about you buy a DVD these days, there's usually a code in it for you to digitally download it. Yeah. Yeah, but where do I keep it when I'm done watching it? Because I'm definitely not deleting it because it's not going to be there forever. Hard drive space is cheap, Matt. Really, You say cheap. cheap and you still don't know my budget, man, which is dirt cheap. Yeah, it's well, cheaper, when you buy, it's when, probably cheaper to buy a terabyte hard drive than a Blu-ray nowadays. About, just about. Seriously, Matt, um, you can get a terabyte hard drive for under $100, and that's a terabyte drive. 
<laughs> anything less than 100 that, 100 and it's exponentially cheaper. You can get, you know, 250 meg thumb drives now for a fiver. Tell me when we can get one terabyte drives for 25 bucks, then I'll be interested and possibly be able to get into the bleeding fray. I would say within Until two then, years, Matt. No. I will predict two years for that. Because then I can actually act keep my computer going then, because right now it's starting to get a bit crowded Please. lately. If, if it's in two years, people will be storing it on their hoverboards, and you won't have time for that shit. Smack. Of course, I, pretty I, soon I, you'll just feel the... Sm I smite you, Bill, Grab because they tried it. lying to us about the hoverboards already. Don't you dare lie to our audience. <laughs> you want Back to, to the future is loud. Back to the future is full of lies and deceit. Okay, so moving on. Um, there's no two pieces of direct Doctor Who news. Uh, the earliest one is the fact that Steve Thompson is confirmed as a writer for uh, Series 8 episode, in particular Series 8 Episode 5. So Steve, um, Steve Thompson you might know as the writer of uh, Curse of the Fatal Spot. I mean, Curse of the Black right? Spot. Spot. Black Spot. Oh, no, sorry. Fatal Curse of the Death, Black Spot Black. and the infamous Journey similar. to the Center of the TARDIS, yeah. which... I, don't know, I kind of refuse to believe that was written by a human. I believe it was written by... Someone put a million monkeys in a room and assumed they would produce the work of Shakespeare, and they produced that instead. I'm, I'm, I'm willing to give him the benefit of the doubt and say he wrote that over the course of a 24-hour period without sleep. And Moffat went, looked at it, and went, "Run it." Without actually editing, because yes. Journey, uh, Curse of the Black Spot was not bad. It wasn't good. It wasn't bad. It was just kind of there. It was, it's not going to be on my top list of Doctor Who episodes to watch. But it's However, not on my list not... of episodes to completely scorn, either. Right. And along along the same line, he wrote the Series 2 closer for Sherlock, and I believe the second episode of Series 3, um, Sherlock fans would probably... I mean, granted, there are varying opinions, but most would not. most people would not despise either of those episodes the way we do Journey to the Center of the Target. So he has one black spot on his record, no pun intended. Oh, yeah, okay, pun intended. Um, Smack you. <laughs> but um, I'm willing to give him a chance, you know? I don't want to see him as showrunner right now. De definitely not with the give him a back chance. mark recently as his last bit of work for us, yeah. I'm kind of on a three-strike policy. He's had He has one strike right now. If he fails this one, it's a second strike. If he fails a third one, time to not hire him again. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and the other piece of related Doctor Who news is a uh, casting decision on... Uh, did you not put this one in there, too? It no, I have be. it. Um, Kelly? Oh, wait, there, there it is, yeah. Kelly, yeah, Keely Hawes to star as a Doctor Who villain who's apparently a banker. Is it the Entertainment Arts one? Yes. Yes. Yes, it is. And we're not sure what episode. Um, Actually, it's the there... same, same episode that we were just talking about. It is? Yes. Yeah, because they are, um, I think they're actually that currently episode is filming... It... Yes, yes, they are. That uh, yes, they're currently I saw filming this episode, news, but didn't include it. Yeah, it is part of the must be the second filming block because they usually film That's three it. episodes at a time. And I, I think, yeah, I think this is episode five as well, so that makes sense. Yeah. Because usually it'll be like one, two, three. Occasionally they'll swap over, like it'll be one, two, four, or something like that. But we know last month they were doing the first filming block. Occasionally they'll film in random order and then release them in different orders in different countries so that people always argue about which uh, serial came first. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because actually I know one of Billy Piper's last scenes as, you know, full-on full, co full -on companion was actually one for uh, um, Satan Pit. Hmm. Um. 
I think Angels yeah. Take Manhattan was filmed before Power of Three as well, if I'm thinking right. Yeah. Yeah, and that's it's sometimes it's due to um availability of sets yeah. and or locations. Right. Yeah. Um I know when they did series stars. four they had to postpone the filming block for uh, Fires of Pompeii due to the studio that they were going to film it in in Italy caught fire and destroyed uh -huh. the sets they were going to be using. Now, if they, only they, had filmed, if they had filmed with the real fire, they could have gone for an authenticity thing. <laughs> oh, oh that's, that's bad, because this was a bad fire. Yeah. It was huge. I mean, um, the sets that were used for that episode, Fires of Pompeii, if you haven't figured it out, um, were the same sets that was used for the BBC production Rome. And apparently uh, there was an electrical fire on the set that basically caused the entire thing to go up in minutes. And the flames were like 25 feet high. I think they need to learn to fire-prone that shit, as, man. My, my, my style as a creator would be to be like, hold on, hold on, get the camera. Yeah, seriously, if you want to know about it, Google 2007 Cinecita Fire. Uh, um, uh, you're missing one thing, Bill. You need uh, some music like this. And this was literally um, Doctor Who was supposed to be there, I think, the week after. Ah. Uh. And um, they it, they had to postpone it by a month for them to clean up the uh, the fire. Um, this, by the way, is the same studio that uh, uh, Ben Hur was filmed in. Hmm. You know, the, the speaking classic. of fires of Pompeii. Speaking of fires of Pompeii, that episode brought us was the first episode of Ke both Karen Gillan and Peter Capaldi. So that means those of you with nothing to do. Watch this episode and try to find out who the next person to become a re a regular actor on Doctor Who from Fi from Fires of Pompeii will be. <laughs> well, um, Randy said Karen Gillian directly got hired because of Fires of Pompeii. Literally, the casting and uh, production staff basically hand fed her to Moffat because of her acting in that particular role. Capaldi, I think, was coincidental. Was that how? Because I think uh, he landed the role after his uh, stint on um, that uh, political sitcom that he was doing for a few years that landed him a lot of applause. Was, was um did, did was that how Agumon got the role? That you, do you know? Like if, if yes, it was that is how Agumon got uh, the role. That is also the how the um, series two finale. What's her face? Uh, Gwen Cooper got her role too was from her ah, scenes yes. in Unquiet Dead. Um, damn, mm -hmm. now that you say that, I can't remember her name. Although, her name it's, is not it's, as It's also as, a long tradition, real. because it's also how Nyssa got landed as a regular companion. Also, kind of Max how, Hill uh, uh, later became the Sixth Doctor. It's also how Jamie got landed as a regular companion. Both yeah. of them went into oh, their yeah, original absolutely. serials, not, not intending to be past the serial. And both of them were liked enough that they that they were continued on. Nicholas Courtney was intended to be a one-off character who was then killed, and then he was brought back as a first recurring character, then essentially companion. Mm -hmm. Of course, these days it's a little different that they're not continuing in the same character. They're continuing in a different role, just yeah, the same actor. Nicholas Courtney did the same thing. His character mm -hmm. was killed well, in his first appearance, and then they brought him back. And he was also movie. from the future. Yeah. Oh well, yeah, but I was I was talking. You were talking about the brig originally. Yeah. Well, yeah, Nicholas Courtney. Mm-hmm. No, his the, first the, appearance the, was in yeah. what Galaxy Five? That's, yeah. Uh, no, it was. Or the uh, Sensorite. Was it, no, no, no. The was it the Dalek no, plan? Dalek's uh, master plan. Yeah. Ah, Dalek's master he plan. Was, Alex Master Plan, they killed him there. Then they brought him back as a, a recurring character when, as a uh, Colonel, was it Colonel uh, Lethbridge Stewart? Something like that. And then. Wait, Brigadier. Yeah, something like that. And then, yeah, the next time they brought him back, he was Brigadier, and he's been Brigadier since until he retired. Yeah, Brigadier, yeah Colonel to Brigadier General, that sounds right. 
Yeah, that, that, that would be right in the actual military. I just don't know how linear Doctor Who was with it. They they did. I think that's how they, they did do it that way. Um, what have we passed uh, okay. over? So, yeah, that's a lot of stuff that gets re redone that way. Um, but so, yeah, so they're now in the second filming block. We've gotten no new um, uh, pictures, by the way. Um, let's see, really what else do we have? Two remaining pieces of articles. So do you want to go with the uh, children's tours or the unhappy time? Let's go with the unhappy one first. Well, let's do what the... Okay. Yeah, let's get that one out of the way. And that's, it's a, so, only a little bit of unhappy. Um, as, we as are sad to report that after James Ellis... Yeah. One at a time. Yeah, of death. So go, go ahead, Randy. You're of just more appropriate. Tradition of death, yes. We are, we, we are sad to report that actor James Ellis died at the age of 82 on uh, March 8th. He was the uh, person that played Peter Wormsley, the archaeologist archaeologist in the uh, 89 Doctor Who story, Battlefield. Um, that is his only Doctor Who appearance, is in that serial. And he was good. I liked him in that. He was a nice, likable character. And he did die at 82, which is a good run. And apparently throughout the... Uh... Throughout the first four Doctor's roles, he was appearing in 565, 565 episodes of uh, Zed Cars. Zed Cars, yes, indeed. A few of those episodes are lost to time, too. Yeah, it's not just Doctor Who that disappeared. There's several series that right. aired in the 50s and 60s from BBC television that are lost, Zed Cars being aren't, one of them. Aren't the original uh, Quatermass serials from the 50s also lost? I believe so. At least some of them. Probably bits and pieces, yeah. They didn't seem to yeah. completely eradicate everything. They, Yeah, the original Quatermass stuff was miniseries, so they've got, like, episode two and episode five, and I think they might you know have a complete serial of one. You know, if, if we were to go back and write a different special for the 50th, I kind of feel like if I... It, it would be interesting if they had, like, a, ser uh, a an episode where... A Cyberman attack, or 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 some monster attack, pretty much attacked the BBC and destroyed old television episodes, or something as kind of an homage to something. Those. Something something got happened. Page got ripped, and it and it caused the snafu that caused all the tapes to be destroyed. Or ju just have them like attacking a certain building, and when we get inside, it's the storage bins where yeah. these things were meant to still be at. Right. And I that would be like that. an in-universe reason why we can't have these tapes. I, I would do with that if they had died in an epic fire. If there had been a horrific fire at BBC that had caused those mm -hmm. tapes to burn instead of a bureaucratic snafu. Because right. what, what caused those tapes to be lost is a bureaucratic snafu. Literally, yes. the, the right hand thought the left hand were keeping their copies, and the left hand thought the right hand were keeping their copies, so both destroyed them. Oh, wow. And so the only ones that came out were uh, copies that were distributed out and didn't come back, or people that thought no one will miss it if I pinch this particular reel or that particular reel mm -hmm. before we destroy them. So that's where we're getting these recovered lost episodes from, are from thieves right. and from uh, distributors that uh, never returned them. I don't know if you necessarily. Reason. I mean, at least for the ones you described, I wouldn't necessarily say thieves. Like uh, the ones where they're basically like, "Well, this is being destroyed." Well, my this is being house destroyed. Is no one's going to miss it. It's kind of trash can. Except for that, that was technically illegal for them to do so. Technically, you know? sure, but I'm pretty sure the statutation of statute of limitations is off on them by now. It doesn't make them not a thief. It just makes them non-prosecutable. They're an alleged thief. They're not a thief until they've been prosecuted. I'm, I'm a bill on this one. <laughs> hey, it's a good thing they did steal them. Yeah. That's all I'm saying. And I'm hoping that somebody stole every one of them. Mm -hmm. We can only hope, and they're being very anymore. stingy. <laughs> um... <sighs> so, and our other uh, yeah. our other piece of news then is uh, 
Uh, actually, Randy, you brought this to us. Do you did you want to talk about this one then, or? Uh, yes. Um, let's see. It was uh, very recently that Lego announced they would be accepting Doctor Who submissions on their Kuso site. Um, on Thursday, a collaborative Who project reached 10,000 supporters, meaning Lego will now officially review and consider the set. Um, this review is due to take place between May and September, and if successful, we will have Lego Doctor Who. And if that continues to be successful, we can almost guarantee a Lego Doctor Who video game, which means that the states will finally have a freaking Doctor Who game of some description. That's not freaking... Uh, fake MMO puzzle game. Yes. That doesn't exist anymore. Which is now dead. Which is not dead. That, that, like that, it that, deserves. That was, that was erased from time and space. And good riddance. Anyway, yes, Lego Doctor Who. Now, and you know, if you using the sock it, screwdriver to build things, I can see that. Um, the Why one thing that the, that's, that, that's a Lego update explained the process in full. We're looking forward to considering this project in the Lego review, but for now an excuse while we go get, make an electroshock device, just in case this really is a nesting plot to take over the world via toy factory. <laughs> and yes, this means I do actually want Lego autons. Yes. Just the awesome. meta of it would be amazing. <laughs> Well, you can easily do it. You just make a slightly bigger than normal Lego body and then just add a huge head to it. And then uh, Auton Episode 4 comes out, and it's a co-production with Lego. <laughs> when Lego... You, you realize that would be the ultimate inside marketing? And, and I really hope the for, Doctor Who production for, staff listens to this. Yes. If they do this. Forget behind the sofa. Do you realize how many households just have... Legos littering the floor that are already deadly traps to step on. <laughs> now imagine the now imagine you walking across these Legos and they basically reach out, grab you, and drag you into the closet. Or even, ah! or even they, or even you 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 go to leave the house and all of a sudden you realize that your Lego toys that were in a box upstairs are now a minefield blocking your door. This would be. This would be epic. I actually want to write this now. This may become a fiction episode that I write. <laughs> that that Legos are concept. actually controlled by a nesting consciousness and they're attacking. Mm -hmm. See, I like this concept. I'm glad to be a part of it. That's more of what, that's more of what Torchwood should have had. There, there's got to be a sequence yeah. where they tie someone down like Gulliver's Travels. I don't know. I'm, I'm going to have to think on this one for a while now. <laughs> now, on, on this specific uh, Lego design, I kind of think that Rose and Tenant are by far the actual best designed ones in this uh, particular well, gallery. Again, this is just pictures. I'm not sure where these pictures actually come from. They're, um, they're basically design ideas at this point. Yeah, they're not None like of official what we may things. See yes. may actually make it to being on the shelf. Yeah, I'm, I'm saying, I'm saying, of all the designs we're looking at, the ones that I think are best are Rose, Tennant, and Jack. I don't know. I really like the Tom Baker face design. Yes. I'm just saying. That yeah, it's the only thing about the Tom Baker. I mean, as we kind of discussed before we started streaming, the Tom Baker one seems rather incomplete. It's a mishmash of various costume bits. Well, just by looking at the hat, I can tell you that that hat doesn't actually belong on that image. It seems to be something that was just put there. Yeah, but that face with that grid, that's mm -hmm. just great. And some of them, you really can, you're all, you can only barely tell who they're supposed to be. We spent yeah. three minutes trying to figure out if that was supposed to be Capaldi or if it was supposed to be John Pertwee. And we're still undecided. <laughs> Until we realized they were all New Era doctors, so that has to be Capaldi. Um, yeah. Jack looks okay. I could tell it was Jack at first glance, but mm -hmm. a lot of the females are kind of, which one, what one, what one's who? Right. Which one's Donna? Which one's... Well, I, uh, could, I could tell which one was Donna pretty quickly, to be honest. I could tell the top one on the right was her. Mm-hmm. Is it that one? But, 
or is it the lower or is it the lower left? I'm pretty sure it's the upper right one. Because she had longer hair, so uh, yeah. Uh, depending <laughs> upon what time, though. I think I think looking at the clothing that the, the the upper right one does make me feel like that's something Donna would wear. I don't know why, but it's... I don't remember her wearing it. I do remember her wearing something that was like in the lower right. So I don't know. I don't the, remember the her wearing something like in the lower right. So or lower left, know. yes. Lower yeah, because if you go by the lower right, that would mean she was a cyberman. Yeah, she's not quite. <laughs> no, you see, actually, that's Jackie Tyler there. Just say. Ah, I see what you did there. Yarg. Ah, I see what you did there. Ah. Um, I saw what you did there, Yeah. I uh, actually do want to see Lego Doctor Who. I think it would be awesome. Um, it would be something to go alongside my Le uh, Lego Lord of the Rings right now. Mm -hmm. I would probably... I, mean, I, I, I might, have we I had might Lego have Star to go Trek? back to Lego. Have we had Lego uh, Star Trek? Lego Star Trek? I know Trek? we've had Lego Star Wars. Not officially, no. Not Lego Star Trek. Because huh. yeah. I know we've had Lego... Because I, I can't imagine that Lego's gone this long without doing an Enterprise. I'm sure fans have made an Enterprise, but not officially, no. Hell, I made a Lego Enterprise, but that was years ago. <laughs> ah, I think... You, you just get, like, five or six Lego. Star Wars kits and start butchering it and making your own. And then you get a Star Wars Trek Lego kit. <laughs> um... No, it's also it... on the licensed property list, so they're it's it's looking into. So they're looking into it, but they still haven't done no, it. No, they yet. they reviewed it and they decided not to do a publication on it. Hmm. I'm 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 seeing I'm seeing a a uh, yeah. I guess a Lego knockoff that did an ent that did uh. It might have been someone else. Might thing. have beat them to the knockoff idea at least. Yeah. And maybe that's why they pulled back. Oh, I guess I guess it's uh something owned by Hasbro called Crayo. Mm. Yeah, okay. But it's not no, official Lego. Just... Yeah. Okay, so yeah, Lego hasn't done anything. No, no Lego Star Trek. No, um... So no Lego Star Trek but, game. But we mm -hmm. have had Lego Star Wars, we've had Lego Lord of the Rings, we've had Lego Batman, I'm pretty sure. We've had some Lego Marvel stuff. Uh, oh, we had Lego there's, DC. I know there's been Lego Batman because he was in the movie, because when I took the What Batman Are You quiz, I got Lego Batman. <laughs> <laughs> I got no parents! <laughs> I don't know how to take that, Bill. I honestly <laughs> I, I, don't. I've never watched... I've never watched the Lego movie, so I have no idea what that Batman is like. He's hilarious, from what I understand. He's he's a standout character in that movie, apparently, for all the good reasons. Mm. Who but voices I guess him? They're, they're... I, I forget, but he does a pretty decent, semi-decent Conroy attempt at Conroy. Mm. When you have a Batman who throws about that... five or six batarangs and finally hits the button and then goes, God, the first time, and drives off... Yeah. Uh, <laughs> the, way, the way they kind of described it was that he was like other bat, like he that he was like the other, like he was like the Conroy, except that you could tell he he enjoyed being Batman and being badass and black. So Will no Arnett is apparently who did the voice of Lego Batman. Yeah, he's a, he's a very comical uh, version of the Conroy Batman. But again, for the good reasons, not any bad reasons. For all the good reasons. <laughs> yeah, I was just checking to see if he'd actually done Batman before. I don't first think time. so that I'm aware of. I think this was his first try at it, and he did really yep. well. So, all the more kudos to him. Yeah. He might get a few more things to do with I DC was, down I the was line. just curious if they got the guy who did Arkham Origins. But no. But doesn't... Conroy do, do those games? Uh, he did. He did the first two. He did not do Origins. Hmm. Neither did um, uh, Mark Hamill do Joker for it. But yeah, the guys I knew that, that they because did, Mark Hamill officially retired after two. Yep. And apparently Conroy retired with him. Oh. Any anyway, um, 
the guys they did do very uncanny imitations of both of them. If you listen very closely, you can tell it's not them, but if you weren't really listening, mm -hmm. you'd be pretty well convinced it was. It's kind of like that guy that did a very Hamill-esque uh, voice when they were doing a... It was an on-YouTube reading of... Uh, uh, P. Gertz, yeah. P. Gertz, yeah. Yeah, I was actually wondering originally if they'd actually gotten him to do the voice, but no, they got a, a professional. Or like that one uh, guy who did YouTube videos, and he did redid yeah. some of the stuff like Red Hood with his yeah, that's Hamill the, voice. Yeah, that's P. yeah. He's also the guy that does the Joker on uh, the Batman Abridged uh, mm -hmm. series. I sure like their Alfred. <laughs> anyway. Yep. I think we're about you know, done with the news then, right? Yeah. Yeah, I think that's it. So that would bring us full circle back to our review for tonight. Yep. yep. Batteries of the Dalek. I believe it's Power Bill. Power of the Dogs. Technically, oh it's about their batteries. Well, considering they're basically, you know, the big thing is that they're sucking power out of a generator, yeah. Mm -hmm. Who wants to do a summary? Not, not it. Can you handle this one, Bill? Because I seem to help to help you a lot with these. That's because my brain does not perceive time in a linear manner. Your brain will not hold the memories. <laughs> it's, it's all a big ball of wibbly-wobbly, plotty-wotty stuff. <sighs> Fine, I guess I'll just give it a try. I'll, I'll give a go with what I can recall. So, this to, is... I was going to read it from the TARDIS data core. Slap. <laughs> Bad Bill. Bad Bill. Copyright infringement. No, well, I was Bill. going to Cease credit desist. them properly. Bad Bill. You, you didn't ask them. can't technically do that. But in an extremely shorthand, just to move things on a bit, because I'm sure we actually have other topics to talk about with this one in particular. Um... So we're starting off right away after the regeneration at the end of the 10th planet, which I might add, I think this happens fairly close to the middle of the season. Uh, this 10th um, planet was the At least a couple of stories in. No, it was, it was uh, a couple smugglers of stories before the end. Oh, so it's a little, just a little way past the halfway the point. Yeah, this was the finale for that season. So the, the rather unusual this, and sudden was, finale. I thought this was the third serial of the season. I was thinking this is um, the fourth one myself, bit. so I wasn't sh totally yeah, sure. Sm Smugglers, Tenth Planet, Power of the Daleks, and then there was what Highlanders and a few others, and then the season ended with Eric with Evil of the Daleks. Oh wow! It was, well, yeah, this was back when they were doing huge series, huge yeah. seasons. Yeah. Yes, yes, this was. So yeah, this was towards more or less the the beginning middle of the season. Um, Patrick Troughton has officially become the Doctor. Um, the Doctor is not entirely sure about himself and even doesn't refer to himself as the Doctor at this point. Uh, the, the new Doctor checks out some stuff in a trunk. He even looks at a reflection of himself and sees the first for a few moments. Um, as the Doctor is still getting used to what's going on around him and trying to collect, collect his thoughts, he takes quite quickly to a stovepipe hat and a flute, I believe it was? Or a recorder. Recorder, recorder yes. Um, after a few moments, he comes to the realization that there's still technically a movement and uh, that they need to finish landing somewhere, and he wants to stretch his legs and get, continue to get used to things. Upon landing, they realize they're in a swamp while he, uh, the doctor, while in, in the TARDIS, found his original diary and is paging through it trying to remember everything. Upon doing so, he does do a, his first comical bit where he apparently manages to avoid a few large sulfurous pits, looks back at, in mild amusement, and continues to walk on. Uh, while the doctor is roaming about, um, 
the companions, um, names are escaping me now. I hate names. <laughs> ben and Polly. Uh, ben and, yeah, Ben and Polly are also trying to keep up with the Doctor, while still arguing amongst themselves as to whether or not it actually is the Doctor. He has all the clothing and everything, but his mannerisms and his appearance are very much changed. Um, while they try to keep up, a cloud of the uh, gas in the swamp comes up and actually starts to knock the both of them out. At the same time, the Doctor encounters a wounded man in the swamps, who is then promptly shot before the Doctor himself is knocked out. And left with, I believe, uh, the insignia from the person who was killed. Some people come to rescue the Doctor and uh, Ben and Polly, and they believe him to be... Well, uh, he, they, they believe him to be from Earth, but I can't remember the name. It's been over a week. <laughs> what do you mean? Uh, what, what, they, what they refer to him as. Oh, they, they are an inspector. The inspector, yeah. The inspector from Earth. So, evidently, the person who died before the doctor was at the real inspector. Uh, plot thickens as the, the lot of them figure out that the inspector was summoned by someone within the settlement on this planet, but no one actually summoned him or is coming forth with the fact that they summoned the inspector for help. Um, and then there's a variety of things going on. First of all, the uh, doctor gets also involved with the fact that they recently found a pod that they're trying to get into that was apparently crash-landed on the plant many, many years before even the settlement was there. Um, they get inside, and uh, by looking at some of the metals, um, they realize that one of the things sitting around, the Doctor already has a copy of while searching through the first Doctor's items. The, the second Doctor instantly knowing, and thus trying to introduce him as being the Doctor, that the piece of metal was actually a key and it's a key to something made by the Daleks. Going back to the pod, um, the Doctor shows the companions that it is in fact the Daleks by using the key to unlock a door and finding three Daleks just standing there unmoving. Uh, they try to figure out uh, a way to try and convince everyone that the Daleks are in fact an actual danger, whereas the scientist who has been involved in trying to unearth the Daleks has actually contacted the Daleks by himself, more or less, first, and is convinced that they are only robots and that they are there to serve, most likely due to the fact that the Daleks are still able to hear what's going on outside of their shells, power or not. So they decided to play along with the game and act like they were robots and not actually living creatures inside of robotic suits. To which we actually do get a rather nice uh, eerie cliffhanger where we do have one of the, the scientists bring in one of the Daleks to show off what it was capable of. Also, for the first time, actually talking while its eye stock focuses on the do doctor while constantly saying, I am your servant, while slowly closing in on him, I believe. Uh, it's hard to tell for sure what all the details that. were in this because these are missing episodes, technically, but uh, it's what they kind of represented in the... Uh, still image video that I was able to watch. Um, unable to convince anyone that the Daleks are a threat originally, the uh, the Doctor, still pretending to be Inspector, is roaming about trying to figure, put all, all the clues together. While doing so, the person who was actually responsible for calling the Inspector is pinned down as being a... Um, a terrorist, I believe they called them? The uh, Resistance? Something like that? Um, part of the Resistance like group. Uh, the part, part of the rebel, the rebel group or Resistance group. Yeah, the Rebel, the rebel Resistance group within the... Uh, within the people there. And um, he's wrongly accused, although the Rebels aren't... It's kind of hard to describe what the rebels are actually rebelling against because they don't really seem to be doing much. A little sabotage here and there, and they don't seem to have a I, real cause. I, I believe that I was, weren't they puppets of the governor to make him look better by defeating them? Or something like that? Yeah, that's technically what they were pretty much set up to be. 
Uh, the th the third guy in charge was actually responsible for making the um, rebels, and was also planning to use them to make himself look better in the end by crushing them. So it was all part of a bigger ploy for him to take power, and also to remove the second in command from power so he could quick more quickly escalate up the totem pole, if you will. And also uh, he also kind of made his own little pseudo security group while the uh, head governor was out so when the governor came back he was quickly thrown out as well so while trying to make this whole rebellion thing work for him uh, the Daleks have in the meantime been recreating themselves in massive numbers inside the pod without anyone knowing until the scientist actually goes in there to have a look because he keeps hearing about bigger and bigger numbers of Daleks that are actually working and running around the entire facility. I believe he heard at least four, or if, if not five, before finally having to go in there and have a look for himself, and he sees the assembly line. Not only uh, the assembly line for making the outer shells, but also seeing the nasty squiggly things that get put inside. So he now also realizes not only are they being mass-produced, but they are mass-produced living creatures inside of machines. And they're definitely not even remotely humanoid at this point. So the basic ploy goes down that uh, since they also want the inspector out of the way, the doctor gets locked up, although the head of the rebellion also realizes who the doctor really is as a fake, because he's the one that murdered the original inspector and thought that the doctor wouldn't be as much of a problem. Guess wrong. Um, after escaping, the doctor also gets the other second in command out, who was also in prison to try and get him out of the way. And they go about trying to essentially set up eventually the plan to stop the Daleks, but not before a big final act attack with the Daleks versus the rebels and the security guards. The dogs pretty much end up on top as predicted until the doctor employs his plan to essentially fry them. I can't remember all the exact details for the very end, but that's basically how it falls down. Uh, the doctor is obviously let go because he helped the right people and got the Dalek menace stopped and put under control. And upon leaving, uh, the doctor goes in. Uh, ben and Polly do remark on the fact that they finally do believe that he is the Doctor now. And there's actually a dead Dalek outside by the TARDIS, to which they rem uh, Ben's final remark was, well, at least this one won't be alive anymore, kicks the Dalek, and as they enter the TARDIS and it starts to take off, the Dalek stock actually moves and looks at the TARDIS, hitting to other possibles possibilities for the Daleks, and some of which we may have already witnessed in the series, since the Daleks also are time travelers themselves now, to some degree. And that about covers my summary. Now, I'm going to, I'm going to respond to the last thing you said before I say what I was actually going to say about this episode, and that is, if you really pay attention to all of the Dalek episodes that we've that have come up to this point, it's very interesting because the Daleks know who the Doctor are. Eh, the Daleks know who the Doctor is, rather. Yet, chronologically, this is the earliest Dalek appearance up to this point. Uh, I don't think so. No, it's because not. If, if, Dalek Invasion of Earth came first. Yes, it would have. Dalek, no, it wouldn't because yes, Dalek would Invasion have. of Earth was the 22nd century, whereas no, according wasn't. to the trail... No, it wasn't. Wasn't it twenty one hundred something? I don't. I don't um, know exactly when it happened, but I know for I a fact that Earth had Earth had not yet colonized out into space. Bill, this is a colony in space from Earth. Yes, but it's a colony in space that, according to the trailer created by the BBC, is in the year twenty twenty. Whereas the Dalek invasion Which of is, Earth, by the way, a big problem with early Doctor Who continuity. Mm -hmm. Um. Okay, Dalek Invasion of Earth, according to it, occurred sometime after 2164. I think the year might have been 
streamlined for the movie version, if I'm thinking right. Because I'm my brain is saying like twenty one fifty, but I don't know if that's right. Oh, let me have a look. Images. I might be I spell images completely right. off I'll my rock on that up. one. Mm. No, it's it's the the basically in the episode. In one of the episodes of Dalek Invasion of Earth, they find a calendar. That's 2164. But Bill is right. The uh, Dalek movie did say 2150 AD. Probably because it's easier to say that in a, tra in a trailer or on a poster. Then 2165, yeah. Or 2265, either way. So if, if you believe the trailer to this episode and that calendar... Power of the Daleks is the earliest Dalek appearance up to this point. Um, trailer for the episode? I ha I haven't seen it, but I've the sources that I've seen said that there was a trailer for this that aired on the BBC saying that it was took place in the year 2020. Not necessarily canonical. That's that's, just, that's think, mostly um, just the BBC pointing out something, right. I, I think. Because that I, could I, just I, that could just be an announcer bozo making up a date too. Gotcha. Like Matt, Matt and I were kind of. Uh, yeah, I wasn't sure under what circumstances we that like, uh, number was coming yeah. from either. So I'm like, like, I don't know. Yeah, and we were saying that just since, since it came from the BBC, we should kind of count it just like we'd count a mini sode in in New Who era. But then again, I they're would, obviously I would have a lot to more. See the context of it. Yeah, was one would have to really see the context. Scene, to or be was sure. it just? Um, it was most like, likely the, it was most likely a narrator. Yeah, because if it's just coming up saying. next on BBC One, the Doctor goes to the year twenty twenty and fights the Daleks. As far as yeah. you know, he That's just made saying. up that date on the spot. Because it right. sounded nice. So well, that, that 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 that's where. That, that's where uh, the argument of whether or not Word of God counts more than the context of the episode. and very For the context of the episode, I would definitely place this as happening much opinions. later than the dog invasion well, of Earth. I would hardly, it would make sense for it to do so. I would hardly think that Joe Announcer would be considered Word of God. <laughs> yeah. I, I think the Word of God would no, be I the creators of the that. actual episode. That his dialogue if he didn't make it up on the spot, was handed to him by somebody not related to the Doctor Who production staff. Hmm. Word of God is considered the production staff of that time. Yes. Okay. The writer, the director, the script editor, and the producer. Um, so if, if, we go, if we go off of just this episode, if we go off of only the episodes, then my comment kind of falls apart. Yes. Because, yes, it, it is it is fairly reasonable to assume that this either is much the later chase in time. or the uh, in, or the invasion or hell you can even say that if with, with we have no reason not to think that it's set after the year 4000 in which case the uh, the doctor could have foiled the Dalek's master plan by this point yeah it's very hard to tell um, I think that's one of the reasons they stopped using dates more often than not yeah, they might give vague hints to centuries, but the only vague. Yeah, because they kind of um, realized they started fucking up when shit happened. Mm-hmm. But yeah, if I was to guess, I would assume this is well after Dalek Invasion of Earth. And it's also very easy to assume that despite an entire plant invasion, eventually the invasion became legend, legend became rumor, rumor became myth. Etc. until the dogs are forgotten many centuries later by these people out in space because sure. we haven't seen the Daleks they don't exist Daleks yeah it's r especially with Dalek history gets a really freaking convoluted because yeah. Scaro um, from the Daleks was supposed to be a long time into the future I mean, like, long time, like, millions of years. Although, I, I do like how the Dalek handbook retconned that, I believe, into saying that the Doctor just got the date wrong. <laughs> Whereas, I, I have, I've, I've seen other things, and it might have even been in the Dalek handbook as well, I don't remember, but I've seen other sources that said that the Daleks themselves left Scarrow 
whereas this was just a group of mutated survivors that found the Dalek casings and went in them to, to survive. That's this a bunch is, of this hokey. Meaning, this meaning the serial, the Daleks, not... Yeah, that's a bunch of it. hokey baloney. Yeah, no. That doesn't work. Yeah, there's... I mean, that, that would make sense. There are too many real Daleks how... that they would have been wiped out way sooner. <laughs> I mean, I mean the, the, the argument for that is essentially that this is also this is set well after any Dalek appearance, plus the fact that they don't act like any other Dalek that we see in the series. So mm -hmm. I can tell you that. Chronologically, for the Daleks, this might have happened after Evil of the Daleks. Right. Which because they recognized the Doctor's second form, and as far as we're aware, he only faced them twice. Yeah, and they're obviously playing, and you oh, can you tell that they're looking at him an awful lot. And re uh, apparently recognize him. Twice, right? Hmm? What was that, Bill? What's... I was asking Randy, he means the second Doctor only faced him twice, right? Yeah. Yeah, the second... Troughton only faced him twice unless there's, like, novels or... Uh, well, there won't be Big Finish audio adventures with him because he was huh? dead by the time Big Finish started. Well... So... Companion Chronicles. Yeah. But unless they have them, and you're counting those, he only faced the Daleks in power and evil, because the next time they showed up was Day of the Daleks. And then Terry Nation took them into America. And went nowhere with them. Mm -hmm. Went nowhere with them because he forgot Dalek Mania was only in Britain. We didn't get a hint of Dalek Mania until about the 80s. So, okay. yeah, sorry, Terry. Okay, fact... It is actually listed on the TARDIS wikia that the, the story is set in the year 2020 is a myth. Oh. Ooh. Ba boom it, is, it, it, it lists that it is stated in a trailer, but is not confirmed on screen. So pretty oh, much. Oh, yeah. So basically exactly what we, what we said. So, what we just said yeah. was that, yeah. Yeah, we're but they actually take call that it with a myth. massive grain of salt. <laughs> the size of Everest. <laughs> I would, I would, I would more call that a debatable, dis or and or disputed fact than a myth in and of itself, because the fact that they stated so in the trailer is not a myth. Yeah, no, they stated in the trailer is not a myth, but the fact is that if you created it as 2020, it doesn't stack up with any other part of history, and it's not specifically said in the series. Okay. And to to go to go off of uh, that's that kind of, well, very loosely brings back to what Matt was saying about it being after the invasion. Which, um, to uh, loosely quote Matt Smith, you don't remember the Daleks invading Earth? The Cybermen? The Titanic almost hitting the palace? Come on, you gotta remember something! <laughs> yeah, I, I was always a little seems, slightly miffed at Moffat about that, but. It seems the time that's... stream exists specifically to erase. to make people. Erase about itself it. every time a new production staff takes over. <clears throat> Just about. And that, yeah, that does start to annoy someone at one point, namely people like me and Randy. Mm. So those of us who grew up with copies of continuity bibles in our hands, and will willingly wield them as weapons over your head if you start screwing it up. <laughs> I have we'll a copy of Hitchhiker's Guide. It's hardcover. It's the size of a bible. I will hit you with that. We'll see if they start paying attention to that in the new Ca the uh, the new Capaldi era. Yeah, we'll wait and see. Arms crossed, angry glare. Look at you, Moffat. Look at you. Yeah. So really, you know, the big thing about this episode is Troughton proving himself to be the Doctor. Yeah, and this this is really. I almost ignore the plot to this episode because it is really the most meta Doctor Who episode you will ever see. Mm -hmm. just, just, it's not about the story. Yeah, it's, it's about it's, the it's about you. Yeah, it's about the it's Ducks. about the audience being Ben and Polly arguing about who this short guy is. Yes, they're they're trying to sell it to the Doctor because this was make or break it. This was you know if they if it didn't come off well. Um, it, it would nobody have was going to buy it. Yeah, and the show would have. This would have been the last season of the show. And, as and result, obviously, they seem to have more personality than I've ever seen them with otherwise. <laughs> they are pretty bland as companions go. 
I mean, really, that was a problem with the first Doctor era companions mm-hmm. following the original three? Is most yeah. of them were yeah, well, like you could say you could say the original four because I've seen a lot of praise for Vicky. I still think she was pale compared to Susan. Yeah. She, she was all right, but she was no Susan. Yeah. Um, because yeah, those three kind of set the standard. <laughs> Considering that the last story I watched with Susan in it was the Reign of Terror, I don't take that as an insult to Vicky. Reign of Terror. Reign of Terror. Reign of Terror is the one where Susan decided that she didn't like rats, so she'd rather face the guillotine than dig her way out where there might be rats. Mm. Ugh. I think right, she also right, okay, that... yeah, now I'm remembering French, yeah. Who was it that the doctor once said that they needed a good smack bottom? I think he mentioned that to maybe Barbara. No, I, it was either Susan or Vicky. And it's like considered to be the worst line that uh, Hartnell ever said. It sounds so awkward. I'm kind of hoping it was Vicky just to make it even more wor- awkward. <laughs> Probably was because I... I kind of get the impression if it were Susan, he would just do it. Being the grumpy grandfather, yeah. And watch this week on Doctor Who as William Hartnell beats up his granddaughter. <clears throat> and that's for not running away from the Daleks in time. <laughs> when I say run, run. <laughs> Run! <laughs> uh, none, none of the search results are about a specific episode, so I have to open them up and try and find that. And on this week's episode of Crossovers, that should never happen. Lynn Minmay becomes the worst companion ever for the Doctor. Oh, Doctor! <laughs> you're, gonna have to, Snack. I, you're gonna have to explain who that one is. Um, uh, so, a character from an uh, old 80s cartoon called Robotech. It is... Did I uh, break Matt? Based... I, think I, I think I broke Matt with that one, yes. Um, uh, she is like known for having the world's Matt worst lost. singing voice and being basically annoying for the entire run of the American version of the show. Uh, she's also very popularly known for saying, Oh, Rick, and getting smacked a lot. <laughs> Oh, the times. <laughs> I'm seeing quotes of it, but it won't say what the episode was from. What? The oh, smack the, bottom the line? smack bottom uh, quote? Yeah. I remember hearing it. I can't remember what episode I was watching when I heard it. I'm just like, wow, that's a little harsh there, Bill. <laughs> Bill came off a little harsh every once in a while, yeah. Yeah. Bill Hartnell, pro- um, proponent of child abuse. Um, actually, it looks like this thinking. We here at the Unearthly Podcast do not condone child Earth. abuse, but we do find it, however, slightly entertaining under right circumstances. Dalek invasion of Earth, so probably Susan. Okay. So Which it was to Susan. So, yeah, he was k- kind Wait, of in the so right, in, maybe. In the same episode where he set her up with a guy and said, now go marry him and be fruitful. <laughs> wow! He was yeah, full of awkward, that that story. Yeah, I, Jeez. I, I think that's the difference between, like, episode one or episode wow. two and episode six of the serial. Wow, that had to be one of the most awkward stories. That's Which story was that? A sharp contrast for one story. Good God. What what story was that? The Dalek Invasion, Invasion of Earth. Earth. Wow, really? I, I think I'm they cut that line that. Out of, I think they cut that line out of the movie. Well, Cushing was a completely different doctor than Hartnell. Yeah. And <laughs> Susan was like a ten year old or an eight year old or something in the movies. Oh, that would have made it worse. Yeah, the, the Susan in the movies was slightly younger than the one that we are aware of in the TV show. And I'm pretty sure Cushing would not have done such a line. 
Oh, and the, the go and prosper thing. Oh, God, that would have been extremely awkward. Thankfully, they did not leave Susan behind in the movie. Thank goodness for that. I don't, did they leave anyone behind in the movie? He left with all of... Uh, the they family. they dropped the police officer guy back off where he they picked him up. And that's... Uh, so he could Kevin? catch the robber. Hmm? Was that Bernard Cribbins? Or? Yes. Which one was Bernard Cribbins? Okay. Yeah, that was... That was Cribbins. Wilf! Yes. That was Wilf! In the early days. Yep. After he got back from, uh, from the Middle East at the end of the war. Go, mm -hmm. Wilf! <laughs> Wilf is awesome. Mm-hmm. But yeah, the... the... Basically, the point of this episode of this episode is whether or not this guy is the doctor. We have Ben and Polly playing up the two different sides, arguing about it. And the rest of it's just a vehicle the, the for him Dalek, to prove himself. Yeah, and the Daleks, the Daleks pretty much confirm it. And of course, by the Daleks recognizing him as the doctor in this type of story, you know that pretty much is saying, okay, obviously he's not going to beat them. Yep. You know, I had a lot more respect for the victory of the Daleks episode before I saw this. <laughs> because I realized how much of their lines and dialogue was basically stolen yeah. from this episode. And the sad thing is, like, re-watching re this, I feel like I'm not even so mad that they stole it. It's that they stole it and didn't do it as well. Yeah, it's the fact that they didn't do it any justice. Borrowing yeah, they, those ideas they, 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 so liberally. They, they stole the idea and deconstructed it, which is kind of... Yeah. Didn't kind like of they, do... It's like they took, they, they took the idea, but didn't use it... Properly. ...in a satisfying way. Yeah. Yeah. Well, because in the victory of the Daleks, it is the victory of the Daleks. They won. Um, the doctor is able to keep them from, you know, destroying the planet, but they get what they wanted and leave. Um, it's really a deconstruction of most of what uh, the standard Doctor Who plot, where you know the Daleks try something and the Doctor defeats them, and they go scampering off with their tail between their legs, so to speak. Still, it. The fact that the fact that what they wanted was to scamper off with their tail between their legs, and that that's what their victory was, doesn't no, strike terror into my heart. Um, what they wanted was the progenation device, which they got it, and they got it activated, right. and they got what they wanted. A a new string of Daleks to basically Pure one of the background of characters for the following two three seasons. But, mm -hmm. like, I, I look at the power of the Daleks, and I think back on that scene, I am the Doctor and you are the Daleks, and I think how much better it could have been used if it was actually in an episode that was trying to do the same thing as Power of the Daleks. The problem Like, if there, it actually were something like regeneration or something of that nature. The problem then is then you're retreading Old Crown. You're basically remaking the yeah. same episode. And to be fair, to be fair, as soon as they said "I am your soldier," they were remaking the same episode. Yeah, but it's still not the the overall same plot. If they were making the exact same episode, um, fifty years, you know, nearly fifty years later, even so, some of the fan base would be a little annoyed by that. Mm -hmm. um, they have taken stories from other works and done them, such as you know, Human Nature, Family of Blood. But when they did, they retooled them. Um, Dalek, probably considered to be the greatest episode of Series 1, is retooled from an audio adventure called Jubilee. Um, and and speak, speaking, speaking of Dalek, I've seen, uh, I think this was, was in the Big Finish listeners group on Facebook, but I've seen people talk about Dalek as also being a partial remake of Power of the Daleks, and I can kind of see that in that they don't really understand what the Dalek is, whereas the Doctor is saying, you know, this is a threat, this is a threat, and no one believes him. Yeah. Uh -huh. But I've, I've, but it's I, a really dumbed-down version of that, though, too. Yeah, like, I, I could so I wouldn't Jubilee see it as necessarily a complete and total copy, either. Yeah. No, yeah. It's no, a little too I simplified. Could, I, I can imagine that 
that that this might have inspired part of Jubilee or part of Dalek, but uh -huh. that other Actually, than that, it, it's more directly part. taken from Jubilee. Some of the dialogue where the doctor's talking to the lone Dalek is pretty much almost verbatim uh, from Jubilee. It was also like written it, by the same guy. Well, like the, the, the like I I could yeah I'm like I could uh, who's that that was Sherman right? Yeah. And I, I could see Sherman as having been inspired by Power of the Daleks when he wrote probably some of the scenes of the Doctor speaking with the other with the humans, trying to convince them how dangerous the Dalek is. It's possible but that he was. It's not. I, it's not necessarily a rip off just because no. of that. No. Or a no. remake or anything of that nature. No. And even you know the whole "I am your servant" lines or your soldier lines in victory. You know, making that, I wouldn't find that by itself to be a direct ripoff. But, but the, the fact that they have to go through the whole thing up to the point of the, you know, I'm the Doctor and you are the Daleks, when you steal that much, yeah. Then we obviously yeah. know where you got your stuff but, from and boo on you. Pretty much the first half of Victory of the Daleks is is a watered-down remake of the first half of Power of the Daleks. Or maybe not the fir mm -hmm. first half, but the first two episodes or so. Yeah, the and the fact... Half. And from there it goes on to try to deconstruct itself. Right. And basically the, the ultimate payoff is, of course, the Sentai Daleks. I will always call them the Sentai Daleks. And, Speaking and of which... Saving the, and saving the world with the power of love. Oh, I can't find them now. Sure, you bring that up again. And, oh, oh, there it is. There it is. It's on stream now. It. What is it? Someone actually made Power Rangers Dalek uh, pay, uh, picture. And, uh, Go, Go Dalek if, Rangers. If any, if anybody's watching, can you point out, is that the Power Rangers SPD logo retooled for Daleks? Because I think it actually, I can always Google that myself. I don't really need a, someone to respond. I just should Google it. But yeah, it's sharing the, the image for Randy. I was trying to get onto the stream. This is faster. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's that's the that's the SPD logo retooled. Okay. Yeah. Someone finally did something at least. See, I never thought that. I always thought of the classic we need dinosaur power now um, routine with the Daleks. But then again, by the time SPD was out, I, you know, nowhere, I, I was no longer having to annually uh, do uh, well, I'm just, I'm, watches. I'm just saying the logo... I'm just saying the logo itself, and that's probably... Mm -hmm. They probably chose it as the easiest logo to adapt. And that's probably why, because it's, you know, it's a shield with words on it. It's easy to change the words and cover that without doing a lot of fancy photoshopping. So that's probably why uh -huh. it shows it. Mm -hmm. I am glad I'm not the only one that had that immediate reaction to... Uh... Well, it's taken them a while to even get that picture out. But, yeah, because the first time I saw that episode, I'm just like, oh my god. It's the freaking Power Rangers as Daleks. It was just the immediate reaction was, oh my god. Like eye roll level of pain. But see, then that, see that I'm, I'm, the the, I'm one of the few people that actually saw both of the movies oh. and I went, oh, actually, they're doing the color version of the Daleks again. Sweet! There's only really one team, or, well, arguably two teams, that actually work with calling the Sentai Daleks. And that's either going with. Uh, Either going with Die Ranger slash uh, Mighty Morphin Season Two, or going with Kaku Ranger slash Mighty Morphin Season Three, because each of those are led by a White Ranger, and this is led by the Supreme White Dalek. Which annoys me because the Dalek Supreme is supposed to be black. There is meant to be Just a black Dalek, it out yes. There. The, no, the Black Dalek has always been the Dalek Supreme. Go watch every Doctor Who serial. The, the and ever only, since the they came exception, up with the concept of the Black Dalek. The only mm -hmm. exception is the Imperial Daleks. 
yes, if if it's the Emperor's right hand, he's a red Dalek, and the black Dalek answers to the red Dalek. Well, I meant when the black Dalek there, there is there is the, a hierarchy of the black Dalek here, for the Renegades. It's the not black, what they the, used in that. The black Daleks were the Renegades. The white Daleks were the Imperial, right? Or didn't no, no. That yeah, well, that's a, that's a completely different matter, and right. not all of them. Well, that's, the that's, black that's Dalek what I'm saying. The that's, of, yeah. that's that's yeah. the only time that the black Dalek is not going to be in charge. Pretty much is the Imperial Daleks. Yes. And the black Dalek was just leading the Renegades. The rest of the Renegades were gray, like the traditional right. like, uh, Genesis of the Daleks gray style. I, I think there was a blend of black and gray depending on how high up the hierarchy they were. Mm, I didn't think so. I thought they. I were would all have to. I would Dalek literally have to sit down and watch all the dog episodes back to back. <laughs> but yes, um, if you'll watch it, the Black Dalek is traditionally the Dalek Supreme. Um, the only few times that we had the, the Red the Dalek Foster was Vader, really. um, was. Um, Though you couldn't see it, the reuses of the movie Daleks in the uh, um, black and white, uh, I think starting, was it with Master Plan and on? Uh, yeah, the, something the chase, like that. The chase. Uh, yeah, the chase, the chase. Possibly Master Plan as well. Okay, so. Chase and and the, um, Master Plan. But um, then we also had some colored Daleks in Day of the Daleks. And. That's where you first, I think, see that the black Dalek answers to the red Dalek, who's usually not a field Dalek. He's usually in some uh, command somewhere. Mm -hmm. That's just like they had the, the red Dalek that interacted directly with Davros in uh, Journey. Although then. I think at that point, I think in that one, the red Dalek answered to the gold Dalek. So Might have. There, there was it's one been a while. Since, it's yeah. been a while since I've seen Day of the Daleks. It's not one I have on DVD, um, so the last time I saw it was somewhere in the 80s. If we ever do a, a stream of Dalek review episodes, um, that's one I'll have to watch again, because it's been too long. But yeah, if there was a gold Dalek in there, that would have been your yellow Dalek from this. And he's definitely inferior to the white one in the hierarchy, too, so... I saw their stream of this stuff, and I'm like, the fuck? <laughs> oh, and on top of that, Cult of Scaro was led by the Black Dalek as well. Yes, True. he was. Yes, it was. Black. The field leader of the Cult of Scaro was a Black Dalek, who eventually became the human Dalek and was killed by the others. Because he was no longer pure. Yep. So, yeah, that's how that much worked, and that's um, kind of screwed up in my part. But we were talking about power. Yeah, we, we just went on a 20-minute rant about Dalek colors in a black-and-white episode. Yes, we did. Mm -hmm. But I think they were still yeah. using the same models in this one. I don't um, know. I wasn't they, they, they had to heavily recycle a lot of the Dalek they, chassis. I know the, so, yeah. the converted one from the chase appeared in here. I'm not sure uh, what the other ones were from. Okay, because um, there's uh, they not, they not, constantly uh, reuse as many Daleks as they could as long as they weren't damaged heavily. Yeah, I could not watch so. the production stills for this because they annoyed me to no end. See, I liked I really liked the one that I found, so I actually was paying attention. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, spe spe speaking so, of those, since I, I, I actually nice I actually listened to, to this episode while playing Civ. Yeah, mm. go ahead. Um, but this is one of the episodes on on the on occasion the BBC would pay uh, a photographer who pretty much I'm pretty sure this was essentially what they did for a living, which was to essentially point a camera at the TV while it's playing uh, the episode and take photographs every few seconds. Um, I'm blanking. Actually, on no, that's not how they did proper it. Proper term for that. The photographer was on set. He was on set. Yeah. Yeah, photographers were on set for these things. Then I, I must I must have read a faulty description because I know the last description I read pretty much said that they pointed a camera at the television and took well that might have been how one section. one person maybe way back in the day kept pictures that's but well. that's not where all the pictures came from mm -hmm. 
a lot yeah, of pictures um, were actually on set. Yeah, because they also have several um, behind-the-scenes pictures done in, by the same artist. So, As a matter of fact, there okay. are actually a couple of color pictures because they were able to actually still do still from, frame color back then. From from Power of the Daleks, or you mean uh, yeah, there's even a couple from Power of the Daleks that I'm seeing occasionally okay. here. I yeah. know. I'm like I know. I, I know what you're referring to because the Marco Polo reconstruction I have, they used the color photos and then tried to yes. reuse a whole serial to match them. And I wasn't particularly a fan of that because I'm sitting down to watch a black and white serial and I'm getting strange colors. Well, for instance, uh, I'm going to zoom in for the audience who are watching on first. But for instance, there's this picture, which I think is actually a double picture. Okay. But that looks to be pretty official. As a matter of fact, I see stagehands reaching in to mess with that Dalek. Is he wearing a kilt? No, those are his pants. He had striped oh. pants. I can't tell if that's the blue shirt from the Three Doctors or if that's just the lighting. No, it's not. The blue, it, The shirt they got for the Three Doctors was a darker blue. Yeah. Uh, fans have pointed that out, that the shirt color was wrong. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's too that's too light to be the same one from Three Doctors. Not to mention, I don't think he had the same suspenders either. No. I don't think he was... Was he wearing suspenders in the Three Doctors? If so, they weren't nearly as loud. The, if, I, yeah. if, I don't think they're as, as blatantly out either. I think he had a jacket on throughout most of the Three Doctors. Yeah, he did. Um... Then again, this wouldn't have been quite as loud with a black and white camera. Yeah. Correct. Yeah, they, they, they really, I mean, you know, that's things like the fact that the original TARDIS console was actually kind of a uh, um, avocado green. Um, yeah, blue-greenish. Mm-hmm. And you know, and it, it was that color because that's what came across as pure white to black and white. Oh, matter of fact, as for that Dalek half of that picture, I just found the full picture now. And we didn't realize the console was that color until early Third Doctor, because they didn't change the console until much later. Right. Yeah, so the fact that these were in color means that they had a color still camera on set taking pictures. Yep. And that's also the case for Marco Polo. But the, the, the ones used for the reconstruction, the, like the photos from that, are black and white. That could have been photos that so, someone managed to digitize over the years from or, an original or photo. It, or, or was it from the Crusade? I don't know. One of them I've seen full color pictures from. I know Marco um, Polo had color pictures, a lot of color pictures. Color. They really loved taking color pictures for that because that, that was yeah, a really good... That, Expensive that, that was, um, episode. A large, a large focus of the episode was the sets. It was the sets it was and the lot. costuming, the yeah, special yeah, costuming exactly. for that episode too. So they had a color photographer come in and take a lot of those stills, mm-hmm. and that was a tradition that they kept every now and again. And this time, I think they wanted the pictures um, because it was Troughton's first episode. Well, I'm also and thinking that were... maybe someone just snuck on set with a color picture. With uh, a color I don't think so. It's still too, too early for that to be fairly common because color cameras in 1967 were freaking expensive. Mm. Um, so no, it would have had to have been a pro- professional. I think what was happening was they were taking these color pictures uh, to possibly find uh, pictures they like and distribute to magazines. True. Things like the Radio Times and other stuff might have actually wanted um, full color pictures of uh, basically uh, Troughton's first serial. Whether it was hit or miss, that didn't matter at that point. They would have wanted, you know, pictures. They of would have wanted pictures to at least see what was going on. And oh my God, Daleks! Yeah, that was the other oh, thing. This... Daleks were always a big draw to uh, get ratings. Mm-hmm. So if they had this, a few, is... if they had a few uh, color pictures of Daleks out there, they were gonna use them to help right. bring in the audience. Uh, this this is kind of an unrelated thought, but it, it it was related to something that was in my head, and I just realized we've talked about Star Trek in this uh, podcast, 
a few times. But we haven't talked about the elephant in the room when it comes to this particular serial on Star Trek. The Vulcan? Yeah. You realize that there's actually a planet in the solar system by that name, don't you? Well, planetoid. Asteroid, I think. Not particularly surprised. It is the name of uh, a Roman god. Exactly. Yeah, not particularly surprising. It just so happens that one fantasy version of it is a little more popular than some of the other real-life versions of it. (laughs) I am of the opinion that Doctor Who and Star Trek do not take place within the same same type space continuum and therefore two different planets. No, even even in their crossover, they clearly stated that they were essentially from two different universes. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't be surprised. It's Um, not the first time that happened to either of them. Yeah. In, in this in this case, it's a rather large coincidence that two major sci-fi shows came up with the name Vulcan within months of each other. Not really. And within when you years go of each other. For names of planets, you look. I think Star Trek used it better because theirs was a hot desert, desert yeah. planet, and this was this here mostly just what a... swamp. Yeah. Yeah, it was a it was a sulfur swamp, right? The sulfur swamp, yes. No. Okay, well, no sulfur I, I, swamp. I know. I, 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 so I, I th- no, I think there were. I think there were mer- wasn't weren't there mercury, mercury swamps? The mercury, mercury, yeah, mercury, mercury swamps, actually, yeah. yeah. They they do like to tie mercury in with phallic episodes in this era for whatever reason. Yeah, it's like the second time at least. Although mm-hmm. although including mercury in the first regeneration episode is kind of a bit of symbolic brilliance there. <laughs> to a degree there's nothing more mercurial than completely changing your face and personality okay I was slightly wrong the planet Vulcan is hypothetical oh okay um, in Earth's solar system it is a, a planet that physicists have proposed exists in an orbit between Mercury and the Sun yeah it's um, have, what the physicists are using it to try to explain certain peculiarities in Mercury's orbit. Okay. Hmm. They've tried so searching for it. They're basically repeatedly. saying it behaves as though there's another ball of mass orbiting. Yeah, the there's a system. there's a wobble. There's a wobble in the orbit. Oh. Not orbital <laughs> wobble. Well, that's how they that's how they found Pluto. <laughs> I know, but orbital wobble is has met, met has Lander bad connotations and... for fans of reviewers. If you ever watch Spoonie or Highlander movies, <laughs> yes, uh, just could be orbital wobble smack. Okay, uh, it, it is an actual physical phenomenon. Yes, it, it but the entire point of the review so in that particular vi- movie, the the the, the, uh, the 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 thing that most of us remember over the wall before is the fact that that's not well, the right answer at all. <laughs> no, regardless of how valid your use of it is. <laughs> mm. uh, there's only one movie I hate more than the source. Hmm. Well, in this case, the it is the correct termino- terminology because it sure, the sure. distance between Mercury and its you know orbital path is basically momentarily moved. Although, and for, 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 they on on that note, I believe that around this time, around uh, the time this serial was released, there were comics coming out saying that Scaro was in our solar system as well. That was uh, that was always considered a possibility by some of the fans, but if you ever watched the the shows, no, it wasn't. No, no. Yeah. Scaro was like way off in the other end of the universe, yeah. like kind of deal, not yeah. even in the same galaxy. So, yeah, that's false. No, I mean it's 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 false can- canonically, but I mean there were comics released, I believe, mm-hmm. around this time that actually claimed that. Yeah, and that was people that did not do the research. Mm-hmm. Or did not care. <laughs> Warning, Dalek Crossing. 
Yep. Um, Anywho, we anyway. are closing in on our last ten minutes. Anything else we wanted to cover? Let's see. That, that, that. Yeah, the fact that the episode's missing annoys the hell out of me. Um, right. It would be. Yeah, it, it would be great if we could really find more of this. Watch production stills. Because watching still images, I tend to start tuning out. Um, uh, see, the version I watched actually had some narration to help speed things up a little bit, so you weren't that constantly waiting on pause images. That doesn't help me. It helped me a lot, so different strokes. I can, you know, deal with it with Big Finish because their episodes are particularly well written so that you understand what's going on in the dialogue, but... Yeah, this one oh, occasionally. Okay. I I wound up um, playing Civ, Civ three while listening to this. And again, this is meant to be an actual video, not yeah. to actually be an audio like Big Finish is. Yes, I know, but I'm saying I kind of it. it my thoughts on it are a little lower because of that. Um, I know there's been some attempts to animate this. Most of them has been pretty crappy. Well, some, one in particular was absolutely wretched and horrible, and I less, listened to to maybe five minutes before I'm like, no, the audio is so horrible, the visuals are so god-awful, no, stop it, and turned it off. Well, you can't even get a single second right of anything. Mm-hmm. Ugh. Oh, done. Yeah, the if... uh... The, the, te the technical term for these specific style is uh, telesnaps. I finally found the uh, article on uh, TARDIS Data Core. Um, the photo photographer's name was John Cura, or Cura, C-U-R-A. And he would take, um, what is I just saw the interval. His, um, damn it. I just saw the interval of how often he took photos, and now I'm not seeing it. <laughs> um, but it does say it, uh, he took photographs of the transmission, and that his camera took images at the PAL frame rate. So I think that indicates that he was taking photos of the actual television for the actual ones that are seen in the reconstruction. So he might have also done the color ones as well. So yeah, he probably did the color ones, but he might have occasionally also taken actual mm -hmm. live camera feed pictures yeah, too. Yeah, for, for the for yeah his method. Ones, yeah, but... okay, the guy that does the telesnaps. Yeah, he did a thirty-five millimeter camera at a television and shoot. Normally, he'd take around sixty photographs for a half hour half hour episode. So yeah, every that would be every thirty seconds essentially. Then, if it's an actual half hour, which I don't think really were so he might it might have been more frequent you know those would have been great to make like viewmaster copies of the episode oh, oh yeah, yeah. brilliant do they still have those like i've seen them on sale again on lately out? yeah they have yeah, viewmaster stuff a comeback. they're coming back okay. again i haven't seen I'm one surprised of those nobody thought of that about almost 20 years yeah, just when you think they're about to die, all of a sudden they just come back in a massive wave. Same yeah. with Creepy Crawlers. Ah, Creepy Crawlers. That I've been seeing Creepy Crawler machines again, too. <laughs> yeah, but you'd think those that those telesnaps would have been perfect for that, wouldn't you? Yeah, yeah they would have. Especially if they are done high enough quality, those, those would have been wonderful. Why yeah. didn't they do that? Yeah, I don't know if Viewmaster was as big over in England as it was here. Well, it also depends upon the time period, though, too. I don't think Viewmaster quite hit its stride way back then, either. No, but it hit its stride in the 70s, 80s. Yeah, from the 70s um, until the 80s. It had a huge, long, oh, nice stride there. Um, and so, related, so to, related to this is one note on here. A telesnap is never in color as Pura died just before the beginning of color television in the United Kingdom. Yeah, it was one guy that did all the telesnaps. So that was pretty much his trademark style that nobody else did, did it mm -hmm. the same way. Mm-hmm. That's how you got the most amount of pictures, I would assume, too. Yeah, I remember being at a store and I saw Viewmaster oh, stuff on sale. I saw another one. What? This one's a little more like it. Power Daleks. <laughs> mm 
Mm. See, I always think of the, the picture where you've got, like, you know, the one in the middle and then one in each corner. Like, you know, their morphing thing. Right. It's always how I've always thought of seen them in my head. Anyway. So, thoughts. Um, yeah, like I, I think said, it's this technically... Is, this is fun. really hard for me because of the fact that the lack of video kind of hurts. I would actually prefer to read the novelization more than I would to try to listen to the audio by yeah, itself. Yeah, maybe. It, it might also clear up a few things, too. Yeah. Um, so it's really hard for me to comment on things like acting and cinematography. Everything sounded okay, but I can't really tell otherwise. I mean, just looking at the photography... Oh, then again, you said you mainly just listen, but just looking at the photography, I can kind of see get some idea of where the cinematography is going mm -hmm. uh, but like I, I mentioned a, I mentioned to Matt off uh, off air at one point it's it's a lot less effective when you have a Dalek staring someone down but it's a still image so mm -hmm. whereas in an actual episode the camera would probably be zooming in menacingly on that eye in the still image you'd get them pretty much just sitting there lazily staring at the camera mm-hmm uh -huh. Yeah, it just doesn't it, it doesn't work well for me. And the still images bother me because it's not coinciding with what's going on. It's either before mm -hmm. or after or something, and it's just my right. brain goes, uh, It's I, like I trying could... to watch a show that you don't have enough bandwidth for. I online. wish I wish I could find the I wish I could find the uh, the version of this that I or first watched where they pretty much animated the telesnaps to make it as close to what the real episode would have looked like as possible. And that would have to have a lot of time and effort added into it, too, in order to do that. Right. I would love... I mean, I don't know if the BBC is planning on having people like Planet 55 um, do all the epi all the missing episodes in animation well i did see a, a one or two that looked like there might have been something similar to planet 55 but i can't be sure if that was an official thing or if that was just a fan thing but um if they did yes because I, I could I, I can stand watching the animated versions even if it's not the greatest animation right. It's but at least still, it's something. People are moving and talking, and it's you know I can keep my attention on it. Mm -hmm. I think what makes something like this a little less likely is for uh, like the tenth planet. They needed one episode out of a four part, so they needed to just animate one episode. Whereas here, that's six episodes they would need to animate, so that's going to cost substantially more. Mm-hmm. True, but also the fact that Fifty Five is now moving over to Britain if things don't get changed soon. Yeah, they might actually be able to afford them a little bit better if they can actually reach out to them a lot faster. I don't know. I I just like to see it done. I'd like to see all of this stuff animated, and you know, if they're worried about it, animate them and re-air them. Yeah, if nothing else, yeah. re-air it and see what people think of it on air. Yeah, I'm sure you'll make your money there as well as the DVD release afterwards. Yeah. You know, Eric, uh, call it Doctor Who, the missing episodes, and, you know, basically run series of missing, you know, missing serials. So how, like how Saturday did you guys mornings. think of this as the first episode to introduce the new star of the show? It worked for that. That was its purpose, and it succeeded. Very much so. Of course, Troughton is very much not, he's a, a much, uh... I'd say more subdued version of the Troughton that we'd eventually get with. You oh know, uh, yeah, he's very subdued. He doesn't he really quite. He doesn't know what. Like, yeah, he doesn't know what quite where the character is going to be going. His version of right. the character, but for what it was, it was a very nice introduction. He's still piecing things together, but he very, mm -hmm. he becomes very much a doctor by the halfway mark, and he's just fine pull, pulling things together right. and figuring it all out. And that that really works even better for modern fans. I mean, it probably worked fairly well in the 60s, but it works... I mean, now we're used to the idea of post-regenerative trauma, a little bit of amnesia, a little bit of identity crisis, so this fits perfectly into what we think a post-regenerative doctor would be like as well. So that At least slightly, better. yes. Yeah. 
Um, yeah, for what I, little I could gather of the images, yeah, it looked like they were definitely putting some effort into it. Um, there was obviously a, a, a good number of actors who got some actual screen time and real lines, so they were definitely pulling out some extra effort and time and money into this one. Also, I really liked the idea of the Daleks trying to keep hush-hush that they're multiplying themselves again, while trying to keep everyone else at bay with the thought that, oh, they're just robots under control. They're, they're fine. Mm -hmm. When they really quickly are becoming not under control, very obviously. Right. They're kind of the Decepticons in this. Yes. I, I, I kind of like the scene where the Doctor is pretty much going through the... Oh, I think, yeah, I'm pretty sure it was the doctor and the head scientist. He's pretty much, he's like, he's like, there were only three Daleks, weren't there? Yes, why? I just saw four. I just saw that, one in not, the... That's uh, not a direct quote. One in the governor's yeah. office and three in the hallway. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's, that's closer to the direct quote. And then uh, you get the little aside stuff with just the dogs where they're where you hear them scheming and they're like, no more than three of us in one place at one time. Got it? Got it? Got it? Yeah, I remember hearing that and going too late. <laughs> too late. Some a couple of people already noticed. I gotta say one thing about this episode, and I it kind of just I I guess just kind of deflates the episode. You hear the title like the power of the Daleks, and you think power as in you know. They're gonna unleash some new big nasty weapon of some sort and. Power as in they need portable batteries. Yeah. Although it was nice to harken back to the old Daleks require static electricity. Yes, and true, to true. up the idea of how they get the static from. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. You so, know, at least at least it wasn't something like you know. Well, these Daleks are now getting thirty gallons to the soul. Gain 30 gallons to the soul. By the way, all these squares that, make a circle. <laughs> that would be a Moffat mod where the Daleks are basically just sucking the souls of people into use as their power source. Uh, Even though that would, had not been anything that happened previously, and then the next episode would have never hear from it again. Yeah. Honestly, I mean, Moffat would do that, but I would kind of more, I mean, that, that would be a direct continuation to some of the mythology that as far as I can tell, was introduced in the RTD era uh, with, uh, for example, Captain Jack uh, overfeeding the monster with life energy. I'm pretty sure nothing like that really existed in who before the RTD era. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, Maybe overpowering something. Well, 10th Planet. Okay, I can... I can, okay. Death Planet, they kept giving it what it wanted and it overpowered yeah. it. Kaboom. It's not, it's not as explicit. It's, kind it's, it's of not more, as explicit, nor is it just a single creature, but it's the still the exact is, same but, idea. Okay. It, it's, it's the forebear of that idea. Yes. Okay. I, Death Planet, yeah, they, they I, are... I actually kind of have to see dead. if that's addressed in a third or fourth Doctor episode anywhere. It might be. It might be used to an extent in Horns of Neiman. Hmm. Maybe. Okay. It's been a long time since I've seen that episode. So there, there's little them. examples here and there, Bill, but not I do totally remember them overloading them. Quite like I that. think they were using some kind of bioenergy drain. Mm -hmm. Anyway, recall, though. we are now running six minutes over, so should we start doing final numbers then? Any of you have anything left to say about it? Not particularly. All right. Pretty much the end. Uh, so I guess I'll go first since I mentioned numbers. Um, definitely a very good first second Doctor episode. Although he again he's not quite the second Doctor we know and love. It'll take a few, uh, at least a few episodes, if not a year or so, before he gets fully into those shoes and goes wild with it. Um, it's still a fairly decent Dalek episode from what little I've seen of it. Uh, if you prefer it sped up with narration, then by all means, seek out the version I saw on YouTube. Uh, just a reminder, though, that the last episode is missing, so you'll have to find another source for that. Um, but overall, I, 
I, I enjoyed it, my little sit through with it, and uh, it did help for me at least for the narration. So, um, trying to think where to put it because it's there's almost as much really good as there is kind of meh. But at least it wasn't horrible by any standards, is the thing. So it's it, it's definitely sl above a three. But I'm wondering if I should put it as high as a four. And that's where I'm coming to record, a struggle. For the, for the record, I'm going to be giving two separate scores. One as the score where if we actually had the episode, and one as the score in its present form. Actually, I, I would agree to that. that. I'll agree I to that, do too. That, Bill. Because huh? I cannot know what it would be like with mm. the, the well, full episode. As a projection of how you know, as a projection, as as uh, as a thing with just still images where we can't say for sure. I would probably have to argue it at about a three. But it, I'm almost certain that if we could actually get a finished product with real animation, acting, etc. That it would probably rate a little bit higher, at least. Right. And that's, I'm, I would say. But its current its standard, form, I would say a three. In its present form, I'd give it a three and a three point five. Um, the main boost being for what they do really with establishing this new doctor. Um, but I do believe that were we to be able to see it, the way it aired, the way it was intended. I'd be giving it a 4.5. So in its present form, I have to say a 3.5. Yeah, still images are nowhere compared to what I would generally consider to be a 4 out of 5 serial. Yeah. I do feel that that's giving it the short end of the stick, considering how you know what, what this it could be. Was when yeah. It was made. Yeah, I actually have to give it a flat three at this point because I cannot tell what it would be like yeah. if mm -hmm. I tried to give it because I can't tell anything about direction, cinematography, any of that. I can't really tell from production stills. And, and, and yeah, that, that, that 4.5 estimate is giving them the benefit of the doubt that the things that, that Randy's describing play out the way that I kind of envision them in my mind from looking at the stills. And I could be completely wrong, but uh -huh. I'd like to think that what I'm seeing at least is logical, especially seeing as how I'm not a professional mm -hmm. in that. But so uh, I have I have to give it a three, and I have to stick with it until I see um, mm -hmm. a a better version. Until it's either found or animated or something. Yes. Because as it is, it's really hard for me to rate it on audio alone. So, with the current versions that we can find online with just the audio and images, it's landing about a 3.17 if you round it up. So, it's still just a pinch better than yeah. average, but just by a pinch. Mm. Yeah, it's and that, really and, and that, 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 pr that pinch is pretty much the effort going into the writing of establishing this new doctor, knowing that if they did it wrong, the show would have ended right there. Yeah, if it and was any worse for writing, it probably would have... Voices. Yeah, and from what we get out of the acting from just the voices alone. So if it was any more lackluster in any writing or acting that we could tell from what little we have, that probably would have quickly fallen right off the scale, to be honest. Yeah, if the voices or acting was flat, and some of the acting was flat, but none of the main cast... Yeah. Yes, you're right. I mean, I'd say Dor Trout at times was flat, but intentionally so when he's kind of being deceptive mm -hmm. and but intentionally. At that playing point, that's out. that's actually not flat. Um, yeah. that, that's him about, overacting, trying to pretend to be flat and being snooty. Some, yeah. What I was talking about, some of the colony people were obviously just jobbers. Yeah. Oh, they okay. came in. They said they read their lines. They get paycheck. You know. There wasn't a lot of um, over the top. The, the the leads were okay. Yeah. Anybody else was a jobber. Now, by lead, you're saying both. The, are you saying both the antagonists and protagonists, or just the protagonists? When you say lead, both both the um, the scientist and the governor 
character. I forget if that was his name. The, there was the governor, the second, in com- the second and third in command, the scientists, the Daleks, the doctors, the companions. Yeah, would be was... very much considered the leads. Yeah, I, uh, I, I think I was okay with the governor, and I think I was okay with the scientists. The other gun, the second, third in command, seemed a little bit jobby to me. They seemed all right. Again, we would have to actually see full animation to figure them out completely. Yep. And the uh, the scientist aides seemed all right, although the one that got shot off early seemed kind of jobby. He didn't yeah. have much to him. You know, still, that's the, that's the equivalent of a red shirt role. Captain, I found something. I don't know. The Daleks are kind of flat. They didn't put much... Uh... Much emotion in their voices. That's the way they're supposed to be. No. You, I mean, no, you can't do tell. Do not, not make me act that way. It's your basic acting voice team of the era. Yeah, I know. No, that, like, it, it, was, it was a joke. I just can't I remember that if that... Good. I can't remember if this era was pre or with Roy Skelton. Because he kind of became the Nick Briggs of his time. <laughs> And I'm typing the name into TARDIS Data Core right now. Handel should be giving me an answer in a few seconds. <laughs> and with that bombshell of his search taking too long, good night, everybody. Oh, wait. No, tune in next week, uh, hopefully, for um, as we will then do uh, Spearhead from Space. Yes. Which is he... the first Pertwee episode. Roy Skelton had started at this point, but he, he did not do Daleks until Evil of the Daleks. So he did the Monoids in the Ark, Cyberman in the Tenth Planet, and then Dalek and Evil of the Daleks. Okay, so, yeah, Appar- after... Apparently, apparently the last Doctor Who thing he did was Daleks for Curse of Fatal Death. <laughs> yeah. Because you'll notice he's in there for, like, every other Dalek episode. He's not in there for Day, but he's in there for Planet... He's in there for he's not in for death, but Genesis Destiny. He's not there for Revelation. resurrection either. Mm. As they go on their tangent. Good night. <laughs> See you all next week. Yep. Spearhead from space. Third doctor. Yep. Some perch we in here. Alrighty. Good night. <laughs>